Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Milan Samard. I am an event facilitator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 1 territory and that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Anishinu, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land traditionally occupied by the Métis community of Rooster Town. We're gathered here this evening to celebrate the launch of What's Not Mine by Nora Dector, an absorbing, darkly funny story of family, addiction, and survival. Following a reading and presentation from Nora, there will be then an opportunity to ask questions. If you're here in person, um, wait, I will approach you with the microphone so the people live streaming from home can hear you. Um, and if you are watching on the YouTube stream, please just type in your questions in the chat box and I will pass it along. Um, I'll be back at the end of the evening to go over signing procedures with our author. Um, Nora Dector is a writer from Treaty One Territory. She studied creative writing at York University and Stony Brook University. And in 2019, she received the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize for the literary fiction for her YA novel, How Far We Go and How Fast. Nora lives in Winnipeg with her partner and their two cats near the foot of Garbage Hill. <laughs> Doesn't get more Winnipeg than that. <laughs> in the words of Meg Wolitzer, author of The Female Persuasion, Nora Dector has written a wrenching, knowing, and wry novel about coming of age into a rough world. Please, please join me in welcoming her. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. It is um, a dream to launch a book at McNally. Um, I did it once before in 2018. Um, I didn't live here though at the time. So it feels even more special um, being back in Winnipeg and at McNally. Um, I grew up coming here, um, used to go to the location um, further up Grant with my dad. And there was a wonderful um, older woman bookseller who would recommend books to me and uh, Felicity. Felicity, apparently. <laughs> um, I did not commit that to memory, but thanks dad. Um, yeah, she would recommend books to me. I would buy based on her recommendation, go home and uh, read them so quickly on the couch that my dad would sometimes yell at me to slow down. Um, so pleasure to be here. Um, Book launches are a little like weird birthday parties that you throw for yourself. So um, it's strange and wonderful to have so many people from different aspects of my life here. Um, or maybe I've been thinking like, maybe it's like a wedding and I'm getting married to my book, something like that. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the book, um, specifically about um, sort of like the, the little light bulb moments that started me on the road to writing it. Um, then I'm going to read a little bit from the book and then I'm hoping that you guys will have some questions. So I know the book just came out this week, but luckily I know some of you have read it already and uh, there's no homework at book launches, but if you have questions, it'd be great to turn this into a bit more of a conversation once I do my, my bit. Um, so some of you know that I teach at U of W. Um, I made the strange and sort of self-punishing decision to have my book launch on the last day of the term. So um, <laughs> Nobody did that to me. I did it to myself. Um, so it's been a bit busy, um, but it is, like I said, a delight to be here. Um, so I'm going to read you like a blurb about the premise of the book, because I really suck at um, describing my own writing. So this is how um, CBC Books described it. So um, in What's Not Mine, Rhea Powers' 16th summer is full of strange and dark occurrences. From plagues of insects, wandering bears, and forest fires to the tightening grip of, fet grip of fentanyl throughout her hometown, Bria's life is divided in two. She lives and works with her cousin, babysitting and slinging burgers by day, and hangs out with an older guy, some boy, by night. 
All the while, the creeping shadow of dependence hangs over Bria until we wonder if she'll ever beat the odds stacked against her. So I'm appreciative of um, people who will describe my work for me. So thanks CBC for that. Um, that's the premise. So that's kind of like a summary of the plot. Um, like I said, the moment that um, the project of a book starts is not like in one single moment for me, sort of more like a series of light bulb moments. Um, so I was gonna tell you guys about a couple of those light bulbs. The first one came, um, when I was going to grad school in the Hamptons on Long Island, which I think is about as spiritually opposed to a place to Winnipeg as you can find. Um, very strange experience. Um, people really do wear like salmon colored sweaters tied around their shoulders. Um, like my mom and I were most shocked by like the old men in white gloves at crossing, uh, <laughs> help, we hope you cross the street. And they also have um, valet parking at the emergency room, which is also interesting. Um, so I'm living in uh, Hamptons, driving up the Long Island Expressway one day in my dad's Honda with friendly Manitoba plates. Um, and I saw what I thought for a second at the side of the road was like the big black round rump of a bear. Um, I kept driving as one does on a freeway and quickly realized that it was actually like a big bag of garbage. There was like a dump truck at the side of the road that had totally lost its load. Um, and that kind of stuck with me. It just got the wheels in my brain turning and reminded me of a story my dad had told me about driving on the highway in Manitoba and um, passing a bear that had been hit by a car. He and my uncle pulled over and kind of with a few other bystanders like figured out what they were gonna do about this dying bear. Um, so I drove home and wrote a scene that was kind of inspired by that, but a bit the opposite in that in the book, um, the characters are driving up down the highway and uh, they see what they think is a bag of garbage on their way to the dump. And in fact, it's a bear. So instead of it being uh, actually me thinking it's a bear and it actually being a bag of garbage the other way around. Um, so sort of like, the truth becoming fiction in that moment. Um, and it got me thinking too about bear stories in general. I think if you grow up here, um, we all kind of have them, you know, like the time like a bear is on the roof of your cabin or bear crashed your party or what have you. Um, so for the first year that I was working on the book, I just called it bear story. Um, and uh, I started to write about uh, a setting. So, um, setting is really important to my writing. I've lived in other places, um, grew up here. Like I said, I went to school in Long Island um, and I lived in Toronto for many years, but for some reason, uh, everything I write is set in Manitoba. So very much like, not to be corny, but it's like the land of my imagination. <laughs> um, so I start working on like a setting for this story that I'm thinking about that has to do with bears. Um, and I invented this town called Beauchamp, which features in the book. Um, and it's filled with like real Manitoba places that I just kind of rearranged. So um, on the cover of the book is this abandoned water park inspired by uh, Skinner's Wet n Wild before it was uh, torn down a few years ago. Um, I put the UFO sighting, famous UFO sighting at Falcon Lake in the book. Um, and then there's a lake kind of inspired by uh, the lake where my family has a cottage, West Hawk Lake, all sort of like deep and dark and formed by a meteorite. Um, so all of these real places, uh, I was also inspired by family who have a place out near Elma, Manitoba, to, to the east of here. Um, and I really loved, loved going out there and seeing um, sort of like where the Canadian Shield ends and the prairies and like farmer's fields take over. But for a little while, they're kind of like all mixed together. So I dropped the town of Beauchamp in this place, um, like east of Winnipeg, about an hour east of Winnipeg, and um, started sort of filling it with characters. Um, so uh, the first year I was writing on it, uh, writing about it, calling it Bear Story, um, it was focused on this guy, sort of like a, a low life, if you will, this like guy in his 30s. Um, who had moved back home to his hometown to try and get clean off of fentanyl. Um, so I'm writing about this guy, it's not really going anywhere for about a year. Um, and in sort of flashback scenes, um, I 
started to create a character named Bria, who would become the main character in the book. Um, and she was like a sort of former drug buddy of this guy, a much younger teenager who he hung out with um, and used with. And in the scenes that I was writing, people were always assuming that they were like romantically involved, despite the um, inappropriateness of that. And I was super resistant to it. Um, I wanted to protect my, my character, not have anything too gross to happen to her. Um, but it kept reoccurring as I wrote. Um, like I said, this draft kind of sucked. It really kind of went nowhere, but all of the best parts of it involved Bria. Um, this kind of uh, very, I don't know, sort of uh, brash girl, super confident, um, the kind of person who needs to like experience and know everything for themselves. Um, and eventually uh, I sort of admitted to myself that, um, that she, they probably would have been involved with each other. That as uh, perilous and kind of gross a situation as it was when it emerged in this first draft, uh, I thought, no, these two would have, would have definitely become involved with each other. She would think that she can handle him and kind of anything. Uh, and, you know, he would just make whatever, whatever sort of decisions uh, that he makes. So anyway, um, he handed over the story to her, or I handed over the story to her after I'd been working on it for about a year. Um, and I think that's about enough of an intro for now. So I'm gonna read you the opening of What's Not Mine. Um, you'll meet Bria and you'll meet this guy that I was telling you about. Um, and his name is Sumboy. She calls him Sumboy kind of as a way to like uh, distance herself from him. Um, so. You read, read you guys the opening of What's Not Mine, and then I think I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of the issues uh, surrounding the book, once you have a bit of a sense of like the tone and the characters. So this is the opening of What's Not Mine. It's well past midnight when who should text me but the mystery dick pic man who's been burning up my phone with his unsolicited appendage for the last couple months. The text comes in, announcing itself with a ding as I pull on my shorts and get ready to leave some boy's apartment. Townhouse, some boy would say, if he could hear me think that. A dick pic, just for me, yippee. Tonight's effort is a strange head-on shot, like up the barrel of a gun. <laughs> Judging by the state of the floors, this clandestine photo shoot was staged in a gas station bathroom, though it seems carefully cropped to highlight the matter at hand. For months now, Almost as long as I've been seeing some boy, I've been getting these texts. Dick pics sent from an unknown number, probably someone left over from last year when I was messing around on apps. I know for a fact it's not some boy because I got one while I was with him, proving his innocence. We were at a bar and neither his dick nor his phone was out at the time. <laughs> but even before that, I knew. They weren't his style, too covert. The texts some boy sends me are direct, punctuationless. Come over, come out tonight. When are you off work? Another day, another dick pic. I try to black out my screen before you can see, but my fingers aren't fast enough. What's that? A rare question mark from him. He takes the phone from my hand, and for a second it's like we're friends, and he's grabbing it to pour over like Steph would, marveling at the mating rituals of our species. But he's not my friend, neither was Steph. What a creep, he says, tossing the phone onto the bed. That's the consensus, I reply, and it makes me feel good to do so. Say what I want to, even when he disapproves. The insolence. He gets up out of bed, gets his jeans from the floor and puts them back on. I'll walk you home, he says. Well, this is a twist. And startled by the turn, I bow to his whim. Never have we walked anywhere except out of the bar, back to his place, into his room. The lights are all off in the kitchen in the front hall, the roommates upstairs in their beds. We go out onto the street. It's quiet, but for crickets and the forever wail of trucks on the big highway that butts up against the edge of town a few blocks from here. Let's go, he says. I lead us to the end of his block and turn up fifth before offering, casual as can be. That was just some rando who texts me dick pics sometimes. I don't even know who it is. He gives me a look. Bria, he says, you could get 50,000 dick pics a day and I wouldn't care. All right then, the air around us is body temp 
inside, outside, day or night, the heat's been steady for weeks, and despite just leaving some boys overly air-conditioned abode, I start sweating. So where is this place, he says briskly. It's like a 15-minute walk, I answer, lying a little, not wanting him to know how far I go to get to him. He knows I live with my aunt and cousins, knows it's a relatively new thing, but even that strikes too juvenile a note to touch on more than briefly. So we don't. Don't do details, don't do plans, just follow the pattern we've been making for months. You don't have to take me the whole way, I add. I know, he says, words tinged with something. I don't get a chance to figure it out though, because then he stops abruptly, having walked right into a tangle of silken caterpillar threads dangling from the tree above us. He recoils, swearing, and tries to shake them off, genuinely grossed out. They are disgusting, especially if you didn't grow up dealing with them. Let me, I say, swiping at the air to catch the strings that are invisible in the dark. One of our ma many plagues in Beauchamp, the caterpillars are especially bad this year, eating the branches bare and shitting all over our cars before dropping their fat, brown, warm bodies down on silk threads to lay their eggs. When we get home, we take pleasure, my cousin Ainsley and I, in picking them off our clothes, out of our hair, and feeding them to the cats. Worst is when they get stuck in my lip gloss at night. It's harder to dodge them in the dark. I free some boy and he pats his body over, checking for worms. They're tricky. Do you want to get them off for you? To avoid the shock of disgust, a couple hours later when one crawls, somehow hairy and yet also clammy and cool, onto the skin at the back of your neck. But you don't want to search so hard that you crush their fragile bodies into your clothes. Hence the gentle pat procedure. Wait, I say, pulling him into the relative illumination of a street light. He has a worm on his shoulder, inching its way up towards his collar. I pluck it off and fling it away. Thanks, he says. And with the same resentful determination he wore, or same look of resentful determination he wore when he insisted on walking me home, he takes my hand. Yikes. That's the feeling in my stomach when he holds my hand. Yikes. So where are we going? He asks again. This way, I say, pointing in the direction of most of Beauchamp. I start forward again, swinging our conjoined hands in the manner of little girls skipping down the sidewalk. And it works. He drops it. Then he takes my hand again. That's when I start to wonder if I've wandered into some kind of pissing contest. Never does some boy walk me home, or even to his door. Generally speaking, I get up and go, and he lies there as he pleases, and it pleases me too, to make my own moves. Fucking dick pic, man. He never shows his face, but the dick in his, in his hand casts a long shadow. I won't hear from him for a week, and then I'll get three in a row. Car dick, bedside dick, bathroom sink dick. <laughs> Sometimes he throws a filter on it. A bedroom scene cast in moody blues, an outdoor oversaturated dick picnic in the park. <laughs> I try to decipher them, like they're visual language, pornographic pictographs. Who is this? I wrote back the first time. He answered right away with an arty aerial shot in black and white, jeans dropped low enough to reveal a badly tattooed tiger head on his thigh. Ugly tattoo, you perv, I replied. And nothing more, until a week later, he texted me a shot where he was brandishing his dick with great urgency, like a hose at a three-alarm fire. <laughs> I should block him, but I don't know. Not that many people text me these days. <laughs> I don't even understand dick pics, really. Dicks, disembodied, feel too thin-skinned to me, like what's inside is strained to get out. It puts me in mind of aliens tumbling out of chest cavities. I thought your aunt lived in an apartment, some boy says loudly. His, eye, his words jumpstart my eyes, and I see suddenly that we're standing on the grass in front of my house. Mine. Not my Aunt Tasha's place with her boyfriend and my cousins where I've been staying since I couldn't stay here anymore. Dad's house, where I'm not supposed to go. She does, I say quickly. And happy to have a hold of him now, I pull him off down the sidewalk, hoping he can't feel my heart pounding in my fingers while I think of an excuse. But nothing brilliant comes. Sorry, I say. Guess I zoned out. He's looking back at the house, not paying attention to me at all, and that's when I do the thing I finally regret. It's not the breaking of the rules set by Tash and enforced by Ames to never go to the house. When I needed to get my stuff after Steph's stuff overdosed, I had to describe to Tash where the object I wanted was and she'd retrieve it for me, hustling to get out of there fast like it was a nuclear disaster site. 
It's not whatever rift might have been caused by the dick pics or the fact that even now he's looking back at the house with an intensity that makes me feel loose in my body, like I could waft away. Here's what I regret. I look back too and see blazing from the kitchen window a light as if someone had just walked in the back door and flipped it on before taking off their shoes. As if someone got up for a glass of water in the middle of the night and left it on. As if someone is in there, but not me. When I go to the house, I'm careful. Leave everything exactly as it was, would never leave a light on. I walk some boy back the extra blocks I brought us silently, thinking about the light. It'll be all I can think about now. I wouldn't be able to do this if some boy was really from Beauchamp. He moved here a couple of years ago because of his ex who's since moved away. He'd wonder why we took this route, overshooting a shorter path by almost a mile. Some boy kisses me goodbye at the corner of Tasha's apartment complex, tongue in my mouth, and then he's gone, crossing the street diagonally as if to get away from me as quickly as possible. Leaves me to make my way up the block to the courtyard entrance to Paradise Gardens so that even after all of this, I still have a feeling I'm being dismissed. So that's uh, the first few pages of what's not mine. Um, and like I said, I wanted you to get a taste for Bria, taste for the voice. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the issues attached to the book. Um, so the way I work is sort of um, like, I don't get the whole picture of a book all at once, but more like little light bulb moments that then kind of form like a constellation of ideas. Uh, and eventually I pull it all together and it becomes like one story. So the book involves um, bears, but it also involves um, fentanyl, the fentanyl overdose crisis. Um, so why fentanyl? Um, years ago, I think like around 2016, I started hearing about it in the news and it really st struck me and stuck with me right away how um, like an already terrible crisis could be getting so much worse. Um, how dangerous it is and, and yeah, just like the terrible escalation of the crisis. Um, so the book opens kind of in the aftermath of an overdose. Um, those events are like alluded to in that opening passage. Um, and uh, I think I'm gonna read just one more short little section um, that talks about the arrival of fentanyl in the town. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the role it plays in the book. Um, so this is just from one chapter on from what I've just read, and again, just talks about uh, the impact that fentanyl has on this, this made-up town of Beauchamp. So then there's the other thing about this summer, or this year overall, I guess, and that's the fact that people keep dying. Well, not always permanently, but it's clear there's poison in the well, which is to say the drug supply. Every few seasons, the trend shifts. This year, pills are in fashion. Pressed ones, fake perks that are actually fentanyl, which is strong to make you feel good, but it's too strong, so you feel so good you forget to breathe. First, there were the boys. Anthony McDonald, son, son of someone Tash knows, OD'd in his car in the parking lot behind the church on Fifth Street on a Tuesday night in February. He was blue by the time the custodian found, custodian found him, and not from the cold. Then Tyler Fournier and Mike Bell on the same night separately in early spring. It hit the news then and everyone at school started talking about it, having heard detailed accounts from older brothers and sisters who knew the guys. They brought in a public health nurse, public health nurse from the city who did a talk in the school gym about the dangers of fentanyl. How these pills weren't like the Percocets and Oxys that people were used to, that they had higher concentrations because they weren't professionally manufactured. So you never really knew how much you were taking or what you were taking. She showed us one of the kits they were handing out at the drugstore to reverse overdoses, and we all got to take one home. Then a couple from Durham died, two real estate agents with their faces on benches who wanted to cut loose one weekend with some MDMA that wasn't what they thought it was. That was the peak, everyone talked about nothing else, and then it died down. Like maybe the pills weren't so strong anymore, or else their users had figured out how to take them safely. Then stuff happened. So. Um, I think um, the issue of the fentanyl overdose crisis is obviously really important to me, um, but you never really want your book to be reduced to just an issue, even if it um, tackles that issue. So um, just know that it's not just about fentanyl and uh, it's not just a bummer and intense. There is a lot of other stuff going on too. 
Um, so we have like uh, Bria's evolving relationship with her cousin Ainsley. Um, it's one of the things that's referenced by the title, What's Not Mine, as they kind of um, figure out where one of their identities ends and the other begins in the way that like um, teenage girls can be so super close and then have to grow apart. Um, and as you guys heard, there's also a dick pic subplot in the book, um, which in a sense adds some levity. Um, there's a mystery that unfolds there. Uh, and, you know, in, in the weeks that uh, preceded my book launch, there's lots of stuff to do for an author, like making social media posts and stuff like that. And if you're me, you also have to tell your parents that there's a dick pic subplot in your book. Um, I think writers, at least me, I do like a sort of mental scan in the weeks and months before a book comes out and people are actually gonna read it and think, okay, what is going to scandalize my grandmother? Um, and I really had a moment of like, oh no, my grandma's gonna open the book and there's dick pics on the first page. Um, and I was briefly like, can I write a new book and just have it printed out for grandma? <laughs> um, so I hope, hopefully haven't scandalized too many people. Um, I know my, my mother-in-law did learn what a dick pic was. From Anyway, so there's a lot going on there. Like I said, place is super important to the book. And then there's this issue attached to it. But character is also super important and voice. Um, and there's a lot of humor and a lot of hope written into it as well. Um, that's kind of like my spiel. So I would love it if you guys have any questions and we can turn it into a bit more of an interactive conversation. Um, anyone? <laughs> so I have read it. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. All the work you did. It's so clean and uh, forceful without, you know, feel pushed along, but pulled. It's very, I found it very hard to put down, um, even though it's not that happy. Mm -hmm. So you sort of feel like putting it down, but then I would always be, be back to it. Um, and, you know, in the first read through, you don't really think about construction. You're just, you know, following the story and trying to figure out what happened. But I was really struck by the, the setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I love that setting. So um, it's fantastic. Um, but this morning I started reading, rereading it a bit. Um, knowing I was coming to the launch and I was really struck by the opening and how much you got done really in, in the section that you read of setting up um, the relationship and a lot of issues around the relationship um, and I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about that. Sure, um, so a couple of things. I think I was telling you guys about how I wrote for like a year, wasn't going anywhere. I had this feeling after my first book that I needed to write a book that wasn't like my first book, which was voicey, people call it, and like written in first person and had like a teenage female narrator. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna do the opposite and show my range. And I'm gonna have like an older male main character and I'm gonna write in third person. And I had to let go of that. Like maybe I will only ever write in first person and that was okay. So um, once I admitted that to myself, I started to, to write the relationship. Um, and I think in getting that, that sort of like um, exploitive relationship, but Bria kind of thinks that she is also taking advantage of him. And maybe she is, but like probably not because the power imbalance is like so off and she's so um, in such a like perilous situation with uh, being a very under supervised youth. Um, so when I started to, to get those sections when she's writing about like going out to this bar in the small town um, and like one of her dad's friends runs the bar and he kind of tolerates her coming in even though she's underage because um, it's like a way that he can supervise her a little bit and also she doesn't take no for an answer. Um, so getting that dynamic down on the page really helped me um, get going on the book. But I was very lucky to have a mentor that I was working on the book with kind of like in the two to three year Mark, just crazy to think that that's how long these things take. Um, and she said, your, your first chapter isn't your first chapter, go write another one. Um, the first chapter is now like the third chapter or something. Um, and she was like, I think we need 
she said, I think we need to open with a dick pic. And I was like, okay, um, I, was, I wasn't going to I'll blame that on you, Susie. Um, and she said, I think you need to open with the two of them, like in scene interacting. And she gave me pretty, um, this is like a year long sort of mentorship program that I did a few years ago, um, where you work with like a peer and then also a mentor. And that mentor can be like more or less hands off. This is the only time she's ever like gone out and told me to write something. Um, and she was like, don't try too hard. Just kind of like channel it, um, which is not how I usually write, but I, but I tried. Um, and, and yeah, these like sort of, um, I don't know. I almost feel like it has like a bit of a film noir like yeah. vibe at the beginning where it was like we open, um, in the aftermath of like a sexual encounter if they're like getting dressed and there's this weird like power dynamic going on where he sees the dick pic and then he's like i'll walk you home which is like way more interest he's ever shown in her than before um and yeah so it's an example of like my mentor being right and um i, I might not have written the scene if she hadn't told me to so thank you susie who might be watching one day <laughs> Thanks for the question, Anne. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Hello. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so this book has a teenage female character and it's a really great book, by the way. Loved it. Couldn't put it down. Absolutely loved it. Thank you, young man. <laughs> um, for your first novel, um, How Far We Go and How Fast, it also had a, um, a teenage main character. But it was a YA book for some reason. I, I didn't totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, they, they read or they see that label YA and they're like, I'm not going to read that. There's like, you know, dragons and vampires or whatever. Um, why do you think this one wasn't labeled YA and why the other one was? Good question. Um, I, I think it's just such a fine line. So like there are, we're all familiar with books that are like about kids or even teenagers that are for adults. Like um, the like most famous top of mind example that I can think of is Catcher in the Rye, right? Um, I was reading some like craft piece recently with a, a person who was talking about how they thought that Catcher in the Rye would be a challenge to publish today because it doesn't like neatly fit into a category and publishers are very concerned with neatly fitting into a category um, or many of them are. Um, so I wrote a YA book. All right, I wrote a book about a teenager. I wasn't entirely sure if it was YA. Um, I don't read a ton of YA, however, I, I really like those books that are in a gray area, sort of in between. Um, and there are crossover readers in both categories, right? Like adults who read YA and precocious teens who read adult fiction. Um, so I, I wrote that book and I was kind of like, well, I'll just send it out to YA publishers. And if they tell me it's not YA, I will go from there. And instead I found a YA publisher. I did hit a few like weird snags with that where like, I don't think my editor ever told me this, but um, I'd taken like a YA class when I was in grad school and the professor had told me, um, don't, use, like, don't use a 25 cent word when a five cent word will do, which as a writer really bothered me, basically telling me to like dumb down the vocabulary kind of. Um, and I've gotten one or two comments about what's not mine in that regard too, where people are like, oh, this 16 year old wouldn't use that word. Um, and maybe she wouldn't, like, I think that, my character is sort of like witty and verbose and like likes words, even if she's not a, a school person. Um, I think there's also like a little bit of, um, like it, we're not thinking that she's a real teenager, right? Like we are still reading a book. So there's a little bit of like the suspension of, of belief there, right? It's like, like a created teenage voice. Um, so I guess my answer is like, I don't concern myself too much with categories. I kind of write whatever I want to write and then I'll let everybody else be stressed out by it. <laughs> but, and they are. Um, yeah, so I kind of went the same thing with this book where I was like, well, I will, I wanted it to be adult fiction just because I don't feel that at home in YA. Like, like I said, it's not what I read usually. I don't 
I don't look down on it at all. Um, but yeah, I like those books that take like a little more sophisticated look at maybe a teenage problem, you know, and YA is really written from that lens of like a book about a young person for a young person. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the questions, but that's like my thoughts on the, on the subject. Thanks. Thank Nick. you. Hi, um, also a great book. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I have a, yeah, a little question. It's a two-parter. Okay. Um, these two questions, don't, they have nothing to do with each other. Um, <laughs> part A, <laughs> um, you talked a bit about your process uh, that you don't necessarily have the entire book in your mind right when you start. And that it kind of comes to you and like these little like, well, as you said, like a consolation. Um, I think how often, let's say the ending or the, you know, like, like a big event, whatever, do you find yourself rewriting the same scene, let's say, over and over? Do you find that? Revision is weird. I find like, um, I'm the most stressed out about um, first drafts. Like I, I feel the most, yeah, I feel the most unsure getting words down on the page. The anxiety of the black blank page is big for me. So I think once we get to like revision, um, I take a lot of like joy and comfort in it. Um, like going over things again and again, not too many times, hopefully, and like trying to see them in a new way. Um, but then you also have to like not beat a dead horse for lack of a better term too. So like um, try not to overwork the work too. So it's like a fine balance, but having mentors and good, um, like first readers, like I, I tend to hold on to my writing for a long time. Um, I don't like people to look at things before they're like developed. Um, but yeah, showing it to like a trusted reader can give you some direction and then you, you sit down with it again. It's definitely sort of how I work, I'd say. Do you find it's really hard to be vulnerable like that though? Like putting it out? I do. Yeah. Um, hmm. I guess maybe you build like a bit of a catalyst or like a muscle over time. I remember being so um, in like early uh, creative writing workshops where you like bring in a story and the whole class reads it. And then um, like, you know, there'll be like one class where everyone goes around the room and like talks about their thoughts on it. That used to terrify me. And I definitely used to like write things um, geared towards like getting the approval of the workshop group um, and school is like a great motivator having assignments and deadlines is great however I think like uh, freeing yourself from that is also good so um, yeah I think like the trusted first reader thing is important so I yeah I wouldn't show it to just anyone off the bat for sure Hi, Maria. Nick uh, kind of asked my first question, so I came up with a second one for you. I read your first book and I loved it um, for two reasons. A, the setting and how you described Winnipeg was really masterful. And second, it was um, it was almost very personal in terms of just that, that young woman's angst and growing up and encountering all these situations. So um, I've since passed on the book to, to a lot of even just um, young nieces that are in our family and something like that so just as inspiration but again was my question I guess is that you described Winnipeg so well and it was such a strong theme in that book was it a conscious decision not to use Winnipeg again here or did Beauchamp kind of come to you as something else um I'd say not like maybe not a conscious decision to not use Winnipeg but I, I was interested in the idea of like not naming the place. Like obviously I made up a name for, um, for like my made up town, which is based on some real places, but I found it really fun. I guess I was very concerned with my first book with like getting Winnipeg right. Um, and I heard some weird opinions from the publishing world about the, um, the sellability of like a book set in Winnipeg. This is when I was a, a student in the States. Um, and like, the whole spectrum from some people who were like, I love like really specific places and like unique settings, that's great. And then other people who were like, but can it just be like um, Minneapolis? Um, so I was interested in like, um, Miriam Taze is one of my favorite writers. And um, sometimes she, like a lot of her books are set in Winnipeg, but she won't name Winnipeg. Sometimes she does, um, or she'll like rename Steinbach something else. But I thought like, 
it would maybe even make Manitoba a little more mysterious and like romanticized to make it very Manitoba, but not necessarily like call it that. Um, and then maybe also sell more books in America too. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Hi, Hi. Um, my first question is when you're writing, or I guess when you're done, do you have a favorite character or like one that kind of like surprises you along the way or that you feel like you're getting to know as you're writing? And if so, who were those characters for you in your books? Hmm. I think, I mean, I do have characters that I'm more fond of, but I think I fall like in love with the character's voice kind of. Um, so when I think of both books, I'm like, yeah, I'm very fond of probably the main characters. Maybe that's <laughs> a good thing. You spend the most time with them. Um, but yeah, falling in love with like, I became very fond of Bria, who is not necessarily like, the easiest person. Um, so it's even like, it's like becoming fond of a person's flaws too, which I guess is kind of like the way you feel about family, right? Where you know them so intimately that you know all the things that are wrong with them and all of the things that are right with them. Um, but yeah, probably my main characters are my favorites. Well, and my other question is maybe a little bit cheesy, but <laughs> if someone asked you how to, not necessarily as like a, a job, becoming a writer but how to incorporate writing into their life as like a hobby what advice would you give them I realize it's probably very personal like how you go about it but I'm just I'm very curious what you would say um what's something I talk about with my students um in like creative writing classes I make them do writing prompts which I always hated as a student so you like free write on a topic which can be very specific or very like open. It can be like one word and you force yourself to not like truly free write. You force yourself to try and not stop writing for like a, a period of like five, 10 minutes, however long. Um, and I always felt very resistant. I always tell this to my students, but I always felt very resistant to doing those very grumpy about having to do it in class, especially because I had professors who would make us all free write. And then one by one around going around the room, we would all read them out loud, which, is scary but I was also just like a my first drafts are terrible and b I'm not a very good like off the bat like listener and then critiquer you know like on the spot um so I have some reservations about writing props however like um many of um like my finished final pieces of writing have been inspired by them so you kind of just like try to suspend your judgment and just write for a certain number of minutes. Um, even if, and I always tell my students this, even if you're just writing, I don't know what to write, the sort of like physical action of either typing or moving your hand across the page will like shake the next thing that you're gonna say loose from your brain. Um, yeah, so that, I, I keep seeing the artist's way over there on the wall. It's like a famous um, book about artistic pra practice. And one of the things that she has um, people who like do the book, the book is like a series of exercises, is morning pages. Um, I did this years ago. And it's like you wake up and kind of the first thing you do is just write two pages about whatever you want. And I, it's pretty hokey stuff in that book. It's useful. But I've always thought that that was like one of the best writing tips. And it's supposed to be like, sort of like before you're fully awake and like you've left a dream state. Yeah. So those would be my two tips. One other tiny question okay. that I have to add on. Do you, when you're writing, say, this book, do you only work on this or do you work on lots of other little things too? I am very singular-minded. Um, I wish that I worked on a whole bunch of things at once. Um, it's not to say that, like, sort of from start to finish, this book was, like, six years um, with, like, long breaks where it was, like, in my editor's hands and then she sent it back to me. Um, usually working in those periods, you know, like doing paid stuff. Um, yeah, I seem to be like a born and bred novelist where I'm like, I'm just gonna focus on this for the next five to 10 years, like not really do anything else. <laughs> um, but I really admire people who can be more like, um, like many fingers and many pots with their writing. Yeah. Well, congratulations, I can't wait to read it. Thank you.
Um, hi, Laura. Um, sorry, I'm kind of, I'll stand up. So hi. <laughs> so, um, my question for you is kind of going off of that last one, but I know you said you had some trouble in the beginning when you were creating the story, but was there anything that you had trouble with, like as someone who is an aspiring writer, who, when you're in the middle of a writer's block, was there a kind of a spot in the story where you were, after going really well, you were like, oh, what do I do? Like, I'm stuck here. I'm blocked here. Like, what are some kinds of tips or things that you have for getting over a writer's block? Or was there any challenges in this story that you had? There always are. Um... <laughs> Hmm. I think that I wrote this sort of like in a non-linear way. So not like I started at the beginning and then I just kept proceeding to the end. I like wrote the beginning and then I wrote the end and it's like, I have to fill in the middle. And sometimes all of that, sometimes non-linear things are like very convoluted even to the person who's trying to uh, articulate them. So I found that sort of like maybe a year, two years, I'd say into the writing of the book. I felt like I was at a bit of an impasse there. Um, my advice would be probably um, to get that trusted second opinion, like from a teacher who you have a relationship with. I've been lucky to have many professors who have been like super generous with their feedback or a friend, um, same thing. I'm lucky to have, I, I don't show everyone my, my work, but like a few people that I trust and just get their take on it. Um, I don't think that you should let people tell you too much about your writing necessarily. I think you also have to trust your gut. Um, yeah, it's a real, it's a real challenge to push through those moments for sure. I think sometimes just like trying all different kinds of stuff, maybe doing some research for a while for a break, um, maybe just truly taking a break and working on something else and then coming back to it. Um, I think kind of like I was saying with my, my mentor telling me to, like not force that new opening scene that she wanted me to write to kind of like sit there and let, let it come to me. Um, I think you have to know like when to, to push and like be strict with yourself and like put your butt in the seat and just work. And then when to like mix it up a bit because, um, because it takes years to write a book for most people. Um, yeah, it's a, a marathon, not a race. So you have to like, yeah, push through, I guess, like your, your plateaus like an athlete would. Yeah. Even though writing is very much not athletic. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite. Thank you. I have like a second question that also kind of goes off of what we talked, spoke about in the last question. Um, coming from someone who's familiar with your assigned writing prompts and sometimes struggling to even know what to write. And as you said, you had some troubles or you had some impasses in the book. What's one thing that you're really proud of that you wrote? Like maybe a certain craft section or character development? Like what's thing that what's one thing that you wrote in this book and you look back and you're like, dang, I did that. Hmm. Um, great question. I think hmm, there's like in both my books, there's like a climactic scene that involves a lot of action. And this one's set at the, the abandoned water park. Um, I take great pleasure in like working through those scenes. Um, Aurora is one of my students. Um, I talked about in class, kind of like the more, um, the more dramatic and tense a moment, the sort of like um, more plain the language gets sometimes. Not plain necessarily, but the less dramatic language gets um yeah so I feel yeah I'm, I'm proud of those those scenes because they're sort of like complicated to orchestrate you know there's like lots of stuff going on from moment to moment okay. do we have any more questions yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um I guess it's said you're pondering the book I started thinking about how many characters there are that are really important to what's happening, but they're absent. I mean, there's a lot of absences in the book, which is really uh, part of what's driving Bria, wherever she's going, that she doesn't know where she's going. Um, but I wondered how, how that worked for you. You know, like the father's away, there's a mother figure who is like long gone, Steph is kind of absent. Um, mm -hmm but yet they're all kind of part of things. 
Yeah. Um, I am a little bit guilty of like not orphaning my main characters, but like sending their adults, um, the adults who are supposed to be in charge of them kind of like off screen. Um, and maybe one day I'm actually going to have to have a character who interacts with their parents. <laughs> That'll be interesting. Um, I think so. Bria's dad appears a few times in the book, but is sort of going through something that's taking him away. And then um, her mom is is totally absent. Um, but I think they make themselves known with like, um, you know, those moments in life where like what your mother would say to you or tell you to do or what your dad would tell you to do, like that voice is just right there in your ear. So even though they're not there with Bria interacting with her, like in real time, they are um, super present in like her consciousness. Um, so the book is full of like quotes, her quoting her dad, you know? Um, yeah. So there's that. Um, and then just like flashback too, you know, so even if they're off screen, flashback can let you see more in the past of characters interacting too. Yeah. It's a bit, a bit of a balancing act though. Yeah. I have a quick question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry if you already answered this, but um, is that, um, is the water park Fun Mountain on, your, on the cover of your book? Now it should be. Uh, <laughs> when I, so when I wrote it, I think it was Skinner's Wet and Wild. Um, and I think it had already been torn down, sort of like when I decided to put that in. But there is um, on YouTube, um, those like urban explorer people, videos of like people after it had closed down and been um, like all graffitied up and was like sort of like a teen party spot. Um, so, like a YouTuber guy like went through with his like little camera on his head and like went through all of that. It's, it's still online. Um, so it's, it's Skinner's Wet and Wild. However, um, when one abandoned water park is torn down, another one rises up in its place. <laughs> so I've now, I've now seen footage of Fun Mountain all, all graffiti up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else? We have a few minutes left before the signing starts. Everybody's satisfied. Okay, great. Um, thanks everybody for coming tonight, for your warm engagement with Nora's work. It's so fun to have like a nice long conversation and to hear what you have to bring about, not just your characters, but your process as well. So thank you so much. Um, we will now proceed to the signing portion of the evening. We ask that you remain seated for just a few moments while we relocate Nora over to the signing desk, uh, which will be uh, on the right side of the cash desk. So copies of the book will be available at the signing desk and also at the cash desk. So you're welcome to grab one to get it signed, but please don't forget to pay for it uh, before you leave the store. That's all we ask. Um, once again, congratulations and thank you to our director.